Thank you to our choir and musicians. I love when we sing about the holiness of God, when we exalt the person in the name of Jesus. Imagine standing one day in his presence. The scripture promises us we shall behold him, and when we see him, we'll be like him. And being able to sing directly into his face the name of Jesus. Great, uh, great time of worship. Thank you again to our musicians. Imagine looking at life from this perspective. Who you are, where you are, what you are is really the sum total of all the decisions that you've made into this life uh, up to this point. All the decisions you've made in this life up to this point. You and I have made literally thousands and thousands of decisions over the course of our time on planet Earth. Every day, you make dozens and dozens more decisions. Think of all the decisions you've already made today. You had to decide what time you were going to get up. And when you woke up, you had to decide, am I going to eat breakfast? And what am I going to eat for breakfast? And at some point, you decided to come to church. I'm really glad you did that. But then you had to decide, what am I going to wear to church? What are the kids going to wear to church? If you have more than one vehicle, you had to decide, what vehicle am I going to drive to church? When you got here, you had to figure out where you're going to park and which door you're going to come in, and finally, where you're going to sit. You know, some of you are already nodding off. I get it. You're wiped out. You've made all those decisions already. Now, we understand that not all decisions are equally important. At some point, I promise at some point, you're going to get to decide where you want to go eat lunch. Now, that's not nearly as important as a decision, where am I going to go to college, if I'm going to go to college? Where am I going to live? Am I going to marry? Who am I going to marry? What is my chosen profession? We understand, again, not all decisions are equally important. So, you are the sum total of all the thousands of decisions that you've made up to this point. Some big, some small. But there is one decision. One decision in the course of your life that stands out from every other decision. One decision that we can say, this is the most important decision in your life. We can say that because that decision not only affects how I will live my life here and now, but it will also impact where you spend eternity. So this morning, our message, your most important decision. Take God's word and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, move down to verse 13. We're entering into the final section in our Lord's Sermon of Sermons, that Sermon on the Mount. As we move into this final section, we're going to see a series of warnings that bring us to a grand conclusion in this greatest sermon ever preached. So taking God's word, stand with me please. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. We stand in honor of the word of God. Matthew seven thirteen, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Please be seated. Now you'll notice that we're only tackling two verses today. It's probably our shortest text in our entire study of the Sermon on the Mount. But you're going to quickly see these are power-packed verses. As I said, with these verses, we enter the final section of the Sermon on the Mount. We've watched as Jesus has laid out his coming kingdom. We've referred to this as his inaugural address. He's laid the foundation. What will life look like in the kingdom of God? 
Who are the citizens of that kingdom and what will their lives look like? How will they react to God? How will they relate to God? How will they relate to one another? He's given us a firm foundation, a complete foundation, everything we need to know regarding the kingdom he's come to establish. And now it's decision time. As he moves into this conclusion, he presents for us a series of warnings. Having heard his words, we are now responsible for responding to those words. Now, remember, every time you listen to a sermon, whether it's in person, online, TV, radio, Every time you sit in a Bible study, every time you read a Christian book, every time you listen to a Christian podcast, you become accountable for that truth. And Jesus is saying now to his listeners, I've laid it out for you. I've given you everything you need to know to be part of my kingdom. And now it is decision time. He presents to us a, a series of warnings here And in the course of the warnings, it's interesting, we see a repetition of contrasting twos. What do you mean contrasting twos? Well, in the passage I just read, we have two different gates, two different roads, two different groups of travelers, and two very different destinations. As we gather next week, Lord willing, we'll see two different trees, two different kinds of fruit, two different judgments. And then we'll conclude with two builders, two houses, two foundations, and two very different outcomes. So what we have before us now in these uh, concluding words, we have three very vivid word pictures. The Lord was a master at using words to help us see his Uh, desires and his his intent in communicating so clearly and creatively in that way. And again, Jesus being the greatest preacher who ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount being the greatest sermon that was ever preached, we see that he is concluding well. He's, He's finishing well. He understands the purpose of preaching. You need to understand the purpose of preaching. The primary purpose of preaching is not to inform The primary purpose of preaching is to bring people to a point of decision. And he does that in crystal crystal clarity. He does it with these three word pictures, each of which brings us to a point of decision. Now, the first word picture, a person coming to a crossroads. This isn't the first time in Scripture that we see that word picture All the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. God speaking through Moses. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live. Moses is nearing the end of his earthly life and ministry. God has raised up a new generation of Hebrews. Their parents have have died during those years in the wilderness. And now a new generation he's raised up, preparing to enter the promised land. And Moses stands before them and he says, now God has laid before us one of two ways, life, a path of life, or a path that ends in death. So just as Moses, the law giver, brought that picture to the people. Now Jesus, the grace giver, brings his people, his followers to that same conclusion. Let me embellish a little bit. I don't think I'm deviating from the text. I don't think I'm adding to what Jesus said. I think I'm, I'm fleshing it out to help us better understand putting ourselves in the original hearer's position. Let me just embellish a little bit. We have the picture now of a man standing at a crossroads. Two gates. One gate is wide. It's spacious. It's easy to get through. You can walk through that gate with your arms full of stuff. You can walk through that gate with other people. You can take someone by the hand. You can walk through that gate easily. It's easily accessible. It's wide. Then there's the other gate. It's narrow. And the word narrow has the idea of being 
constricting. Literally, you have to squeeze your way through the narrow gate. There's no room for you to bring anything with you, and you have to walk through by yourself. So as you look through those gates, you see the road that, uh, that goes from the wide gate. You, you notice it's paved. It's level. It's smooth. The word that comes to mind is easy. And then you look through the narrow gate. Oh, what a contrast. It's a rugged road. It's mostly uphill. The word that comes to your mind, hard. Ooh, that looks like a hard way. You look again through the wide gate, you'll notice that it's well populated. There are lots of people. It's crowded with people. They're all walking and chatting, and they, they appear to be happy. And then you look through the narrow gate, and you'll notice it's sparsely populated. Just a few folks here and there, and then there's some, what appear to be some stretches of just loneliness. Now, this isn't in the text, but I believe this is Jesus' intent. Imagine that there is a sign over each gate, and on that sign, the same words, this way to heaven. This way to heaven. Now, we've got to get beyond our vacation Bible school flannel board lesson of the two gates and the two roads, all right? You remember it well. There's the wide gate, and there's the broad road, and then there's the, the gaping mouth of hell there at the end, you know, and it's, it appears everyone on that road understands they're going to hell. That's not Jesus' intent here. Throughout this message, this sermon, he's been contrasting his way with the way of the Jewish religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees. There is a wide and appealing and easy road populated with many people. That is the road of self-righteousness. That is the road of the religious hypocrites. That is the road that's performance-based. I'm earning my way to heaven. By contrast, Jesus' road, the narrow road, is the road where we come and acknowledge that we are totally dependent upon God. We put our faith and trust in the person of Jesus, believing his death on the cross pays the price for our sin. And only by his God-given righteousness can we enter into God's favor. Let's move forward comparing the two roads. You're going to see that basically there are four points of comparison uh, on the two roads. So, Here's number one. One has a narrow gate, the other a wide gate. One has a narrow gate, the other a wide gate. Jesus begins this illustration, verse 13, with the command, enter by the narrow gate. If you could read that in the original Greek, the grammar clearly communicates it's a command. It's not an invitation. It's not an encouragement. It is a command. Enter by the narrow gate. Notice the emphasis, the narrow gate. Significance of the narrow gate, number one, you must enter this gate. If you want access to the true road, if you want access to a relationship with God, if you want access to eternal life here and forever, you have to go through the narrow gate. And what does the narrow gate represent? It represents the person of Jesus. John 10. Now, in John 10, we have an extended allegory. Jesus, the shepherd, and he's caring for the sheep, and, and he really, he fleshes all of that out. But in John 10, 7 and then verse 9, we read, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Now, the uh, shepherds out in the field need a place to protect their sheep at night. So they build a, a fold. We would call it a corral. They build it out of rocks, and, and it's probably about waist high. And again, it's to protect the sheep within and to keep the predators outside. And there's only one gate, and a shepherd's on guard. If a shepherd's by himself, we're told at times that shepherd would even lie down and sleep 
at that open spot so he would be awakened if anything tried to go over him, either to get in or to get out. So Jesus presents himself in this sense. I am the door. I am the narrow gate. I am the only way that you can access eternal life, the life that God the Father desires to give. John 14 opens up with a shocking announcement. Jesus says, I'm going away. John 14, 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice that response. Thomas, I am the way. I am the way. It's not a set of directions or instructions. I am the way. It's through me, a relationship with me. Now notice, he didn't say, I am a way, or I am one of the ways. He didn't say, I'm the best way. He presents it, I am the only way to a relationship with the Father. His followers understood this. The preaching of Peter in Acts 4.12, we heard the verse read earlier. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only one name, the name of Jesus. Paul understood it. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. One mediator, one name, one way, one door. Now, by contrast, we have the wide gate. The wide gate represents a different approach. Different thinking. Uh, the wide gate, there's room for diversity. Uh, the wide gate, there's room for different opinions, different ideas. Uh, let me just give you some illustrations of wide gate thinking. See if you've ever heard someone say something like this. You know, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. As long as you're sincere. Now, what's wrong with that? One of the most sincerest men who ever lived was named Adolf Hitler. He sincerely believed in the annihilation of the Jewish race. Those 9-11 terrorists who flew planes into buildings were sincere. The last recorded words from the cockpit was a prayer, Allah Akbar, God is great. They were sincere. The terrorists who attacked Israel last fall from Gaza. They were sincere in believing in their cause. Now here's the problem. If we make sincerity the measure of authenticity, what happens when a person is sincerely wrong? Wide gate thinking. Anyone ever looked you in the face and said this? I can't believe a loving God would send anyone to hell. I just can't believe a loving God would send anyone to hell. Who in Scripture said more about hell than anyone else? You might think, well, probably one of those Old Testament prophets, you know, Elijah. Uh, I mean, those guys, they shot straight. Nope, actually, it was a New Testament person. Well, probably John the Baptist. I mean, he was a, he was a rough guy. Nope. The person in Scripture who said more about hell than anyone else was Jesus Christ. Warning after warning after warning about hell. More wide gate thinking. Have you heard this? You know, really, it doesn't matter what you believe because we all worship the same God. Well, first, that person is uh, flaunting their ignorance of world religions because World religions quickly contradict. Some worship one God, some worship multiple gods. And they worship those gods in very different and at times contradictory ways. But you're going to hear it from time to time, the wagon wheel illustration. I remember the first time I heard it, it was here in Bartlesville. 
I was in high school. I showed up on Tuesday night to go out on visitation. They would partner us up, you know, with an adult so that we could go out and, and watch others share the gospel and disciple and mentor us to, to be able to share the gospel. And I remember us standing on a guy's porch, and the fellow who was leading our team, you know, he introduced himself. We're from First Baptist Church. Can we tell you about a relationship with Christ? And I remember that guy stepped up and said, no, no, let me stop you right there. Here's the way I see it. It's like a wagon wheel. See, God's at the center. God's at the hub of the wheel. All these different spokes that come from different directions, but they all worship the same God. Again, that is wide gate thinking. Sometime you're, if you're going to be true to Jesus, if you're going to speak like Jesus spoke, there are going to be times that someone labels you narrow-minded. Let me tell you, if you and I are going to walk through a narrow gate, if we're going to walk a narrow road, we've got to be narrow-minded sometimes. And don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed of that. A second significance of the narrow gate. You must enter this gate now. Not just you must enter this gate. It's the only true gate. You must enter this gate now. In the original grammar, there's a sense of urgency here. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, now he's quoting first from Isaiah 49. In a favorable time I listened to you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. And then he adds this, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Here's our tendency. We have the audacity, because of our fallenness, because of our spiritual blindness, we have the audacity to expect God to come to us on our terms. You know, I'm going to get serious about a relationship with Christ someday, but I want to have fun first. I want to sow my wild oats. And then when I'm good and ready and I've experienced all that I want to experience, then I'll get serious about my relationship with God. And the scripture says today is the day of salvation. There's no promise of tomorrow. There's no guarantee that you're going to fall under the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit again. You're gambling with eternity. Today is the day of salvation. A third significance of the narrow gate, you must enter this gate alone. You must enter this gate. You must enter this gate now. You must enter this gate alone. Twice Jesus refers to it as a narrow gate, 13 and 14. He did that for emphasis. Now, what's the significance of calling it a narrow gate? Well, first, his listeners understood the way that a walled city was constructed. You knew that uh, the, uh, the, the most vulnerable point of attack in a walled city is the gate. And so the gates have to be designed in such a way that uh, you can deal with, with the attackers. So here's a picture of an ancient city and and the narrow gate of that ancient city. You can see how it's long and thin, narrow. And the idea being that it it becomes a choke point. You you know, if you can limit your attackers to just two or three abreast, you can deal with that. If it's dozens abreast, then, then you've probably lost in your defensive position. So they understood this idea of a narrow gate. Most walled cities had narrow gates. They got that. That, that was very, a very common expression for them. Let me update it for you, though. And let, me, let me give you, again, here's, here's the point of what Jesus was saying. Imagine with me this image, a turnstile. This is really what Jesus was trying to communicate to us. It's a turnstile. I, I have to go through the narrow gate by myself. Many of us are blessed to have godly Christian parents. You have godly Christian parents who are praying for you. How blessed are grandparents who are praying for you? How blessed are you? But listen to me. You will not make it onto the narrow road through the faith of your godly parents. They can't bring you with them. Your grandmother can't bring you with them. Some people think, well, you know, I've I've got my membership in a church. So I'm okay because I'm a member of a church as if the church in mass is going to walk through the gate of heaven together. Jesus says, no. 
It's a narrow gate. You have to come by yourself. Your faith, your trust, your repentance, giving your life to Christ. Years ago, Billy Graham led an evangelistic meeting in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, A few days after that meeting, a letter was printed in the Melbourne Daily Paper and printed on the editorial page, and here's what the letter read. After hearing Dr. Billy Graham on the air, viewing him on TV, reading reports and letters concerning him and his mission, I am heartedly sick of the type of religion that insists my soul and everyone else's needs saving, whatever that means. I have never felt that I was lost, nor do I feel that I daily wallow in the mire of sin, although his preaching insists that I do. Give me a practical religion that teaches gentleness and tolerance, that acknowledges no barriers of color or creed, that remembers the aged and teaches children of goodness and not of sin. See, that's wide gate thinking. A second point of comparison, not only a wide versus a narrow gate, uh, the one is hard, the other is easy. The one is hard, the other is easy. Verse 13, the way is easy that leads to destruction. Verse 14, the way is hard that leads to life. In a sense, Jesus is ending this sermon in the same way that he started it. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 5. This was months ago that we looked at the passages. Let me just refresh your memory. Matthew chapter 5, look down at verse 3. We call these the Beatitudes. These were the characteristics of kingdom citizens. He starts by giving us eight characteristics. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This has nothing to do with how much money you have in the bank or your your socioeconomic level. He's talking about spiritual poverty. Blessed are those, welcomed are those who acknowledge they are spiritually poor. They have no goodness on their own. They have nothing to offer God. They come as spiritual paupers and say, Lord, I've got nothing to offer but just my life and to put my faith and trust in Christ. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. They're mourning over their sin. They're acknowledging their rebellious hearts, their evil and wicked hearts, and they're acknowledging that before God, and they're grieved by it because they know it's grieved God. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. They're submitting their will to Christ. They're dying to self. They're putting themselves at his complete disposal. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall, not, uh, they shall be satisfied. They have no righteousness on their own. Their heart is wicked. They've been in rebellion against God, so they've come putting faith and trust in Christ and appropriating God's gift of righteousness. These are hard things. And most people are unwilling to do them. Then we get to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hey, there's a way to start a movement. By the way, follow me and people aren't going to like you. Follow me, and you're going to be unpopular at times. Follow me, and you're going to be despised, spurned, hated by others. Uh, Again, we think of this VBS, uh, you know, and I'm not knocking VBS. I love VBS, but, you know, sometimes we get these things in our mind. And so here's the broad road this way, and here's the narrow road this way. Let me give you a different perspective. What if the narrow road actually goes right down the middle of the broad road? except you're going in the opposite direction. You're walking against the flow. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 13, the gate is wide, the way is easy. You know how easy the wide gate road is? It's so easy, you don't have to do anything. You and I are born lost. We're born separated from God. We come to an age of accountability. God's going to hold us accountable for our sin. If you do nothing, 
regarding faith in Christ, repentance, salvation. If you do nothing, you're on the wide road, the easy road. That's how easy it is. Luke 14, 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot become my disciple. Now, he, he starts this passage with, Great crowds were following him. Jesus is at the peak of his popularity. Throngs of people are following him. And then he turns and he issues this very, very challenging invitation. By the way, you need to have such love for me that your love for anyone else looks like hatred. And you have to be willing to even hate your own life because you love me so much more than you love yourself. And by the way, you've got to be willing to renounce everything you've got. Can you see his disciples thinking, Lord, what, what are you doing? Are you trying to run people off? No. They need to understand. They need to count the cost. Why? It's a hard road. It's a hard road at times. Back in the 1990s, I had the privilege of traveling to Moscow, Russia, and uh, preaching at the dedication of a church that our church in Texas helped build there in Moscow. I still count it one of the uh, great privileges of my life. And so uh, I landed a day early, and the pastor of the church said, I'm going to show you Moscow, and he showed me lots of things. And then he said, you being a preacher, you'll, you'll enjoy this. And he took me to the largest Baptist church in Moscow. Now, at this point, the wall had fallen. They were no, under, no longer un, under communism. But under communism, the communists allowed one Baptist church to stay open in Moscow, and it was this church. And this church was famous because in 1982, they allowed Billy Graham. Again, communists were still in control. It was, tip, it was, it was technically an atheist country. But they allowed Billy Graham to come and preach the gospel there. And as I stood on the platform behind that pulpit, they said, this is where Billy Graham stood. And, and I just looked out, and it, it, there was, it was a large, more of a square building with a balcony. And I've heard the stories and read the, the, the stories. It was packed with people. And then they opened all the windows, and they opened the back doors so that people could crowd all around the building to try and hear the preaching of the gospel. Now, the man that was showing us around the room was a custodian there at the church. He said, can I tell you my story? I said, sure. He said, you know, our system of education, basically you, you go through junior high, and if you have high marks, good grades, then, then you're put on a, a, on a track where you can go on and get higher education and eventually college, and of course those are the best jobs and the best benefits. He said, uh, I, I was raised in a Christian home and had been, again, I've heard the gospel all my life, but I'd never made a public profession. And he said, here's the reason. I knew the moment I made a public profession of faith and was baptized, immediately that track would be closed to me. I would be given no more education, and he had made very strong grades. I'd be given no more education, no opportunities for growth, for a, a decent salary to provide for my family. He said, I, I knew that. That was the cost of living under a communist government. But he said, one night as I wrestled with these things, I knew in my heart, without Christ I would, would have nothing. Without Christ I'd be lost. I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized. Immediately, that door shut. And the best that I could find was to be a custodian here at, at this church. And they've graciously allowed me to serve here for several decades now. I heard that story. And I'll be honest, I, I thought in my heart, God, what would I have done? Would I have been willing to forego a college education and all the benefits that come? Would I have been willing to do that? And only God knows. Comparing the two roads, one has few travelers, the other is crowded. 
One has few travelers, the other is crowded. Again, verse 13. Those who enter by the wide gate are many. And verse 14. Those who find the narrow gate are few. Now that becomes a, a pattern. When you study Scripture, you want to look for patterns, and you're going to see this repeated pattern. You see it in the Old Testament. Israel, the remnant of Israel, there were only a few that remained faithful to God. Many did not. Uh, look down in chapter 7. Look down to verse 22. We're going to look in more detail at this verse next week. It's a description of the final judgment of unbelievers. 7.22. On that day, what? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We're going to see these people are rejected because they believed they could earn God's favor by their good works. But notice again, many will say to me. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Luke 13, 23. Someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now this is a sister passage to what we're reading and studying in Matthew 7. We've seen these before. Jesus, itinerant preacher, traveling and preaching and saying similar things in different places. But here he he gives an exhortation. Strive to enter through the narrow door. That word strive, in the original language, agonizomai, it's the word that we translate agonize. Agonize to enter through the narrow door. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul uses that word to describe a runner who is training himself or herself so they can beat other runners in the races. They agonize, they sacrifice, they give things up. He uses the word also in 1 Timothy 6.12. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I have agonized the good fight. In other words, in both passages, they overcame an adversary. They overcame an adversary. What's the adversary? It's you. It's me. Few are unwilling. I mean, most are, are unwilling to acknowledge their spiritual poverty, to choose the road of sacrifice and repentance. Few only are willing to do that. You say, Greg, that verse 24, many, I tell you, will seek to enter, will not be able. Why? Because they're seeking to enter based on their good works, or they've waited too long and the door is shut. The final point of comparison one road leads to life, the other to destruction. Again, verse 13, the gate is wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction. Verse 14, the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life. Chuck Swindoll tells a funny story. Uh, uh, Thomas Huxley was a well-known agnostic in his day. This was back in the, uh, the 1800s. Huxley was uh, invited to Dublin to bring a lecture, and he went a little long, and he, he, he realized he was going to miss his train to get back to the boat, to get back home. And so he uh, uh, flagged down one of the horse-drawn taxis, and he, he said, Dri Driver, uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a hurry. I want you to drive as fast as you can. Yes, sir. And they take off at this uh, lightning pace. He closes his eyes there, and he's just kind of resting a, and then he opens his eyes and he looks out. He knows they're going the wrong direction. And he realized, I didn't tell him where to go. He said, driver, do you know where you're going? He said, no, my honor, but I'm going as fast as I can. Now, again, you need to understand the nature of the roads. As you're standing at the gate and you see the different roads, you see that one is easy and one is hard. You, you see that one is crowded and one has few. But what you don't see are the final destinations. 
See, that's why the wide gate says this way to heaven, and that's why people think they're doing the right thing. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is, is the way of death. It seems right. I mean, there's so many others. And, and the idea that if I live a good life and if I do my best and God would never send, a loving God would, would never send someone to hell. It, it, it seems right. Feels good. But the end, death. Jesus uses an interesting word here. It's translated destruction. The end is destruction. It's used again in Matthew 26, 8. Remember the story, Jesus is with his, uh, you know, good friends, and uh, one of the women anoints him with that very expensive perfume-like anointing oil. She just pours it all over Jesus, and, and she has a sense that he's near his death, and there's a sense in which she's anointing his body. And you remember the disciples watched that display, that lavish display of worship, and what did they call it? Waste. What a waste. A Judas was leading the pack. He was the treasurer. And we're told that he was pilfering money. It was for selfish purpose. Waste. You think about this. Here you are. You're created in the image and likeness of God. God has created you. He's fashioned you after his own image and likeness. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good, a future, and a hope. He sent his son who shed his blood, a ransom for many. The price has been paid. And you live your life only for you. And you die in your sins. What a waste. What a waste. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus made reference to the gates of hell. That's the wide road. It is literally the gate of hell. I heard this story years ago. I never forgot it. A man was driving down a, a two-lane highway late at night, dark, no lights around, street lights, anything, just, just dark and driving alone. There at the very edge of his headlights, he made a figure it seemed to be a man standing in the middle of the road, just frantically waving his hands, frantically waving his hands. And he got closer and he could see it. It was a man. He couldn't see a car, couldn't see anything else. Just this man standing in the middle of the road, just frantically waving his hands. He was yelling something, but he couldn't understand. His first impulse was just to drive on by. What's this guy doing out here in the middle of the night on this road, this isolated road? Am I in danger? Is he going to try to hurt me? He said, but I decided, I, well, maybe I better see what's going on. So he, he slowed down and just kind of cracked his window just a little bit. And the man said, thank God you stopped. Thank God you stopped. He said, I was following another car just a few minutes ago. And I watched as we approached a bridge. And as that car drove onto the bridge, it collapsed. And the car and the bridge went into the water. And immediately I slammed on my brakes and I just barely stopped in time. Or I would have been in the water and dead as well. He said, thank God you stopped because already three of the cars have gone by and they wouldn't stop. And they all fell to their death. Now hear me. Whether you're here in person, whether you're watching this online, I sound like a wild man. I get it. I'm that crazy guy up here waving his arms saying, turn around, turn around. And all the world says, nah, 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 we're going to do other things. We're going to find other distractions. We, we don't need that. We don't need that narrow-minded preaching. We're more sophisticated than that. You know what I'm saying. You feel like a crazy person sometimes. You love them. You, you try to share with them. You, you try to demonstrate Christ's love. We don't come in to condemn. Jesus said they're already condemned. I've come to give life. Lovingly and kindly, but firmly. We have to say, there is only one name under heaven. There's only one way, and that's the person of Jesus.
Two questions and we're done. Number one, what road are you on right now? What road are you on right now? Two roads. Jesus left us no other options. Two roads. One that leads to life. One that honors Christ. A life of serving and loving and worship and ministry. Sacrifice. Sometimes persecution. But even then, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Or a life of selfishness. Maybe popularity. Maybe, by the world's definition, success. But in the end, destruction. You say, Greg, I I don't really know how to answer that question. I I know what I want, but to be honest, I'm just not sure. Still in chapter 7, look up to verse 7 with me. We talked about this verse last week. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. That's Jesus' invitation to you right now. Ask for my forgiveness. Seek my will. Knock on the door, and it will be open to you. Last question. Who do you know and care about that's on the wrong road? Who do you know and care about that's on the wrong road? Spouse, parent, sibling, child, prodigal child, prodigal grandchild? Someone challenged me with a question. I think it was sometime last year. just really shook me. The question, if God answered all the prayers you prayed last week, How many people would have been saved as a result of that? That was shocking to me. Because I had to acknowledge, not very many. I'm not being intentional to pray for that unbeliever, that God would soften their heart, that they would fall into conviction, that God would grant them repentance. Who do you know that's on the wrong road? What are you doing about it? Would you bow with me just a moment? Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Someone needs to do that right now. Just open your heart up to God. God, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I've lived my life selfishly. I've broken your commandments. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that God loves me as a plan for me, but I must put my faith and trust in you. And you will bring me to the Father. Just cry out to God right now, right where you're sitting. Lord, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. Help me find the narrow gate, the way to life. Father, we are amazed that even a few would have the opportunity because we're undeserving. We're sinners. We're rebels. We're enemies of God. We know that, Lord. Our hearts are wicked and deceitful beyond our ability to understand, but you have loved us. Sent your Son for us. So honored to be your children, Father. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, please. Pastor Kevin and I are standing here at the front. We'd be honored to have a conversation with you, pray with you, answer questions, encourage you. You don't have to come to us. Again, you're wrestling. You're crying out to God, just come find your spot here at the front, off to yourself. Or maybe again, God has burdened you for someone that you believe is on that wrong road, someone you deeply care about. Just come by yourself, find a spot, pray for that person. Ask a friend to come or your spouse, pray with you for that person. Just cry out to God.
As we sing now and worship the Lord, turning our hearts to him, you obey God.